Number one says, here's an image showing the highest point of the path of a ball after one bounce. Someone is collecting data to model the bounce height of this ball after each bounce. Which measurement for the location of the top of the ball would be the best one to record? So if we take a look at this um, ball, I'll just kind of look at the top here. Um, and that's a little high. So if we go down here, um, we can see that the top of the ball is there. And this looks like it's measuring in centimeters. Um, we can see that in the answer choices that it says centimeters. And so centimeters are split into 10 equal pieces. And so if you do one whole divided by 10, that gives you 0.1 for each of those little dashes. So this is at 26 and then one, two, three, four tenths. So 26 and four tenths is the same as 26.4. So B would be the best option there. Number two, function H describes the height of a ball in inches after N bounces, and it's defined by this equation. What is H of three? So H of three is gonna be 120 times four fifths to the third power which will give you approximately 61. Um, and this represents the height of the ball after three bounces. Could H of N or the height of the ball be 150 and explain how you know? And this um, would be no, because the initial height of our ball is, is 120. Um, so initial, like what they dropped it from, right? So the initial height is 120. And then we see that the growth factor is less than one, meaning that it's the height is gonna be less and less and less over time. So, and your growth factor is less than one so it won't um, get bigger. It'll just keep getting smaller. So it won't be able to go up to 150. Which ball loses its height more quickly? Um, this ball or a tennis ball whose height in inches after n bounces is modeled by this function? Um, so we have the first one, which has a growth factor or a decay factor of 0.8. So this one um, is keeping 80% of its height. And then we have this one, whose growth factor is 5 ninths. And that one, if you do 5 divided by 9, is giving you 0.55. So that one is keeping up, well, 0.555, so more like 0.56. But so that one's keeping about 55 or 56% of its height. Um, so this one wants to know which one is losing its height more quickly. Well, that's going to be this one because it's only 55% of its height each time versus 80% of its height. How many bounces would it take for the ball to be less than 12 inches from the surface? So you can start um, just plugging some random numbers in if you wanted to. You could create a table um, to kind of see. Remember, we're using the 120 times 4 fifths um, to the N equation. And so if you just started plugging in some numbers here for n and figuring out what that height is like if we plugged in six we would get 31.45 so that's still over the 12. Um, you could plug in eight and get like 20.13 so we're getting closer here right so you could plug in um, 10 and that's 12.88 um, which is really close. So now if we go ahead and plug in um, 11, 11 will kick back 10.31 inches. So this tells us it's at 12.9 inches at, after 10 bounces. 
On the 11th bounce, it's going to be at 10.31, so 11 bounces to get below 12 inches. Number three, after its second bounce, a ball reaches a height of 80. The rebound factor for the ball was 0.7. From approximately what height was the ball dropped? Now you have a couple different ways of tackling this problem since it's multiple choice. So we have, um, you know, we know that um, the second bounce so zero, one, two bounces produces 80, right? So, and then the, the factor is 0.7. So this means whatever our initial amount is, we're going to multiply that by 0.7. And then we're going to take that new amount and we're going to multiply by 0.7 again, right? To get to 80. So you could just do that to each of these. You can multiply each of these by 0.7 twice and see which one got you the closest to 80. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is by thinking about this growth factor, right? So we're multiplying this by 0.7. We're multiplying this by 0.7 to get to that 80. So what's the backwards of multiplying by 0 0.7? So if we wanted to go backwards, okay, how do you undo multiplying by 0 0.7 would be dividing by 0 0.7. And then we could divide by 0 0.7 again to come up with the answer on our own. So if we do 80 divided by 0 0.7, we get about 114. And then when we do 114 divided by 0 0.7, we get about 163, and that gets us to answer D. Number four, which equation is most appropriate for modeling this data? Um, so you can just go ahead and plug these values in and see what you get. So for this first one, when we do 64 times 1.25 to the first, we get 80. When we plug in two, we get 100, which is pretty close. When we plug in three, we get 125. When we plug in four, we get about 156. When we plug in five, we get about 195, and these are all still pretty close. And when we plug in six, we get about 244. So all of these are really close. So this one's probably going to be the winner. Um, I still like to check the others just to make sure. So when we plug one into here, and we do 79 times 1.25, we get 98. Well, that's pretty far off from 79. This one's much closer. So I'm going to rule out B right away. Um, option C, when we do this, so if we do 79 plus 1.25x, we get about, we get 80.25. Okay, so that's pretty close. Um, so that's not significantly further away. So I'm going to keep trying. Um, and I'm going to plug in 2, and I get 81.5. Well, that's way off of this one, okay? So this is much better um, than that. So I'm going to cross off C. And then D will do a similar thing. So 64 plus 22 times 1 would give us 86, which is pretty far off from that. But if we plug in a couple more, we get 108, we get 130. All of these are kind of close, 152, then we get to 174, which is pretty far off from that, and then 194, which is significantly further off of that. So our best bet in this case is option A. Number five, the table shows the number of employees and number of active customer accounts for some different marketing companies. Would a linear or an exponential model for the relationship between the number of employees and number of customers be more appropriate. So remember, a linear model is repeated addition or subtraction versus exponential is multiplication or division would connect those output values, those Y values. So when we look at this, um, if we look at it from a linear standpoint, we see that we add four to go up from four to eight. Eight to 13 is up five. 
13 to 17 is up four. And then be careful here because there's a jump. So when we do this next one for the average change between these, um, I would do 39 minus 17 and then divide it by this interval of six. And that'll give you about um, 3.7 for that change. So these look to be, you know, going up by four, five, four, about four for that average right there. So that's pretty close. If we look exponentially, um, when we do eight divided by four, okay, to figure out what the growth factor is there, um, you get two, right? And then when we do 13 divided by eight, we get 1.625. And then when we do 17 divided by 13, we get 1.3. So these are pretty far off, right? And if you kept expanding by two, um, if we looked at just multiplying by two, four times two was eight times two is 16. Then we get to 32 already by four. And if we went all the way up to 10, that would be huge because this is for five, six, seven, eight, nine, whoops. and then 10, 2048 if we were doing exponentially versus 39. So linear is going to be a much better um, choice. So linear is most appropriate. Um, because the data, so the data is going up at a pretty consistent rate of about four, right? So up adding by about four, four, five, 3.7. So right around four. Number six, a bank account has a balance of $1,000. It grows by a factor of 1.04 each year. Explain why the balance in dollars is a function of the number of years since the account was opened. So this is because um, any year will produce a specific value for the account. So you can be like, all right, after four years, how much is in the account? There's a specific answer for that. There's not multiple different answers. So each year produces one amount. And then write the equation of this. So we know that we do the initial amount and let's do F of T equals the initial amount times the growth factor. So 1.04 and then to the T power. Number seven, the table shows the number of people who went to see a musical on the dth day of April. So the 1st of April, 2nd of April, 3rd of April. What is the average rate of change from day one to seven? Okay, so day one is here, day seven is here. So average rate of change, remember you subtract the output first. Okay, so 1720, the new output divided by the original output and then over the interval. And really it's it's subtracting, you know, the input. Um, but you, if you see that it's a six year difference, you could just divide by six. So when we do this, we get 186. When we subtract on top, divided by six gives us 31. So 31 based on the, the day of the month, right? And then it says, is the average rate of change a good measure for how the number of people changed throughout the week? So did it just go up 31 people per day? Um, and that's not a good indicator, right? We see this went way up to 2,000, 2,300, 2,400, down to 22, back up to 2,350, up to 2,390, and then down to 17. So, you know, the data, if we kind of think about what it's going to look like. It's like here, 
then it's here, 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 and then back down, right? So did it just consistently do this? No. Um, so no, because the number of people went up and down in the middle. They didn't just consistently go up. So they didn't just consistently go up 31 per day. Number eight, this graph shows the cost in dollars of mailing a letter from the United States to Canada in 2018 as a function of the weight in ounces. So how much does it cost to send a letter that's 1.5 ounces? So if we look at where 1.5 is on the graph, um, so this is one. So 1 1.5 is here. And that's costing a dollar fifteen. So it's costing one dollar and fifteen cents. Then it says, how much does it cost to send a letter um, that weighs two ounces? So then we can look at two, and we go to here. And remember, you want to go to the closed circle. Open circle means it's not the data point. Okay. So if we're exactly at two, then it is costing us a dollar fifteen. Now, if it, if it was 2.1 ounces, then it would be 161. Okay, anything above two um, up to looks like three something is going to be 161. What is the range of this function? So the range is the value, the Y values that, well, in this case, the cost that can be kicked out. So we've got this is at 115, then we've got 161, then we've got 208, and there's nothing in between. So the range of this function is just those three values, 115, 161, and 208. 